welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to episode 20. Each month on the podcast, we bring you news and insights from the American Translators Association. Today's episode is all about ATA divisions and chapters. We're going to find out what they are, how they work, why it pays to be a member, and more. And to do so, we're going to talk with Lucy Gunderson and Tony Guerra. Lucy chairs the ATA Divisions Committee, and Tony chairs the ATA Chapters Committee. Let's talk to Lucy first. Lucy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Matt. I'm really pleased to have this chance to talk to you about divisions. Great. Thanks for joining us. Tell us, what are ATA divisions? So ATA divisions are member-driven, language-specific and subject-specific groups. Um, They're run entirely by member volunteers, but they do get a, a lot of support from ATA headquarters and also from the board. The primary goal of divisions is to keep members informed about industry trends, career development, and professional resources. And to achieve this goal, they're required to provide core services, which include having a website, a listserv, different social media groups on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, a blog and a newsletter, and also they're required to provide assistance planning for the ATA annual conference. Okay. How many divisions are there? Well, currently we have 20 divisions. There are 12 language-specific divisions and eight subject-specific divisions. And we have one division in the works, um, which we're hoping the board will approve shortly. What's the name of that division? Um, It's going to be a law division. What are a few other examples of subject-specific divisions? We have a medical division, interpreters division, science and technology division, educators, government, language technology, literary, and translation company divisions. Right on. That is a nice, well-rounded list there. Yes. (laughs) Have divisions always been a part of ATA? Uh, How did they get started? Well, that's an interesting question, and I'd also like to thank Mary David at ATA. Headquarters who provided us with this information. But the first sort of request to form a special group within ATA came in the early 1960s. And this group wanted to form an Eastern Languages International Group. And the board was very enthusiastic about this and they gave this group division status. But unfortunately, I guess it kind of fizzled out and the program sort of went inactive in the 1970s. And no other group sought division status until the early 1980s. Um, In that decade, we had about four or five new divisions started. And then in the 1990s, it really took off. We had a bunch of divisions created um, in that decade, and we've grown steadily since then. Let's, Let's talk a little bit about the benefits of membership. Why, why should I join a division? What's, what's in it for me, so to speak? So I think for many people, a division is a home within the larger association. And for me, the main benefit of divisions is the ability to network with like-minded colleagues. This networking takes place in person at the conference and also online through the platforms I mentioned before. And as as you as people use these platforms to seek advice on translation issues or reference materials they get to know other people and i think a division becomes a source of referrals for work for many division members so that is i think the really the huge benefit of division membership i think you're right uh i see it as kind of a community within the greater community of the ATA Association. You mentioned like-minded earlier, and that's really what it is. I'm a member of the German language division, and I joined it right away when I joined the ATA. Uh, It just seemed totally logical to me as a German-English translator to be associated and have uh, access to these platforms, such as the listserv, uh, and back then, I think that's that's all we had was a listserv. There wasn't a Facebook page at that time, but just a way to communicate 
with other German translators. I mean, we're all sitting, most of us are sitting at home, isolated in our home offices. And what better way than to have, have a network of people that you can rely on and ask questions to. Exactly. And then there's the social aspect too, when you, you know, you interacted online all year. And then when you go to the conference and you actually see people in person, which is really a lot of fun also. Yes, I agree. It just reminded me of the annual networking event. Most uh, divisions, as far as I know, I know the German language division does one every year, holds an annual networking event at the conference one of the evenings. And it's, it's one of the highlights of my conference every year. Definitely, I agree. Okay, now tell our listeners how they can join uh, a division. Okay, first I want to mention there are no limits on division membership. You can join all 20 if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. And you can join um, initially when you join the ATA. You can join a division when you renew your membership every year. And you can also uh, join a division anytime by logging onto the ATA website and going to your online profile. So it's very easy and um you can do it anytime you want to. It's basically just clicking a box, right? When you uh, register or re-register or on your online profile, correct? Exactly, exactly. Um, it's it's right there on your renewal form. And then on your profile, I think it's like the second line down. Um, says you are a member of X number of divisions, modify. And you would click on that and the list pops up and you can check or uncheck whatever you want. Okay, great. You mentioned earlier when I asked you what ATA divisions are, that they are member or volunteer-led, volunteer-run organizations, so to speak. Right. Why, why volunteer for a division? That's a great question. I think, of course, there's the idea of giving back to your profession and to your colleagues, which is tremendously important. But I can also say as an ATA volunteer myself that I think many volunteers find their work for ATA has helped them grow their own personal networks and help them learn diverse skills that they can then apply in their own businesses. So for myself as a volunteer, I've improved my writing skills, my public speaking skills, sort of general communication people skills, um, as well as management and organizational skills. and. You know, we mentioned before people that sort of particularly translators work in isolation. And so if you're self-employed, you really need to, you don't have a place to develop these skills and they're really essential business skills. So I would encourage people to volunteer, um, to keep that in mind when they think about volunteering, think about how it can help you in your own business also. I couldn't agree with you more, Lucy. I, as a volunteer for the GLD as well as the editor of the GLD newsletter, I have learned so much in that process, like the organizational th side of things. I, it's allowed me to improve my my writing. It's given me a a you know avenue, a a place, a platform, so to speak, uh, to to write and uh, working with others. I've gotten way more out of it than I put into it. I know that for a fact. Yeah, I, I can say the same for myself, definitely. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners today? Um, I would just say, don't be shy about volunteering. Um, division leaders are always happy to see new faces. They're happy to hear new ideas, and they will definitely find something for you to do. Um, and if you're approached by a division leader, if, if someone asks you to write an article or organize an event, just do it. <laughs> um, that's how I got started. I was asked at my first conference to write um, a newcomer's review of the conference for our newsletter, and I sort of never stopped after that. <laughs> so, like we mentioned, the rewards of volunteering far outweigh the time requirements, and I really encourage everyone to get involved. Excellent. Lucy, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Matt. It's really a pleasure for me. All right. Now, before you run off and join a division, 
Let's talk chapters. Joining me now is Tony Guerra, chair of the ATA Chapters Committee. Tony also serves as a director on the ATA board. Tony, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Matt. It's great to be here. Thanks for asking me, and I'm delighted to to uh, have the opportunity to talk about chapters. Perfect. It's great to be talking with you. Let's get right to it, Tony. Tell our listeners, what are ATA chapters? Chapters are local associations throughout the United States made up of language professionals. They all share in basically the same structure and mission and receive guidance from the ATA. In a nutshell, they function as a forum or platform for translators and interpreters in a specific geographical area. They organize meetings to further information exchange and cooperation. They provide information and services needed on the local level, often giving insight into the industry news and trends. They also provide a means of communication between the ATA and local members, and they support and promote the policies and objectives of the ATA. And often, they also host the ATA uh, translation certification exams. That's an important function. Great. Now. ATA website lists both chapters and affiliates. What are affiliates? Well, right now there are 14 chapters and 10 affiliates. Affiliates are similar organizations but are not bound by the same ATA reporting requirements and regulatory obligations as chapters. Some chapters started out as cooperating groups and eventually petitioned a change of status once they met the criteria to establish themselves as a chapter. These included petitioning for the establishment of a chapter, which must be signed by 20 or more members of the association who reside or work in the designated geographical area. And they have to signify their intentions to remain members of the association. And then this petition must include a copy of the bylaws of the proposed chapter. Then these petitions are submitted to the ATA board of directors, which in its discretion shall determine whether the chapter may be established. Can you share a little history with us? How did ATA come to have chapters and affiliates? Well, some groups started entirely uh, independently from ATA and in later years petitioned to become an ATA chapter, while other groups started and petitioned for chapterhood in the same year. I received some excellent information which revealed the following information. From historical documents, there doesn't appear to have been any thought, at least on paper, of organizing chapters when ATA was established. It doesn't seem as if there was ever a uh, let's start a chapter document. According to Mary, Dale Cunningham, a Philadelphia translator, decided to organize a local group. He really set the gold standard for what a chapter should be. That is, very active educational programs, job exchanges, sharing ideas, and language evenings. He requested and was granted a charter for the group in 1961. This was the Delaware Valley Translators Association, which is my local chapter. It has been and continues to be a very active group and boasts of a diverse and numerous membership with a ratio of about 50-50 translators and interpreters. Now, the New Yorkers established the New York Metropolitan Chapter of ATA, NYMCATA, in 1962. There was some disagreement about the sense or logic in establishing a chapter in New York because at that time, the majority of ATA's officers and directors lived in New York. The argument was that there was some duplication of effort, and hence, after a few years, it was short-lived. The current chapter, the New York Circle of Translators, is now a thriving and dynamic group. The West Coast, not to be outdone by the East, established the California chapter of the American Translators Association, Cal CHAP ATA, in 1963. The advent of chapters fit in perfectly with the early goal of ATA, building a national network of translators. Today's ATA chapters and affiliates exist much for the same reason as those early groups, continuing education and the opportunity to share ideas. Most importantly, just like the good old days, every ATA chapter and affiliate provides a community that goes above and beyond any online forum. You, those are a lot of reasons to join as well that you've thrown into the history there. It's a very interesting history as well, how, how, uh, how everything came together. Now, but I can hear some people asking, 
why join a chapter when I'm already a member of the ATA? Or vice versa, why join ATA when I'm already a member of my local chapter? Does So tell us, does, does chapter membership complement or enhance ATA membership? This is a great question, Matt, and I'm really glad you asked it. There are many misconceptions out there and many people who, by choosing one or the other, are depriving themselves of the terrific benefits of membership at both local and national levels. Each offers different benefits and each really do perform complementary roles. The local chapter provides a more immediate sense of engagement for the linguistic community by connecting translators and interpreters within a geographical area throughout regular networking gatherings with colleagues, bringing industry experts and introducing them to local corporate and institutional members. They also offer uh, affordable, easy access to professional development and educational events, creating strong bonds, professional friendships, promoting and energizing a strong and vibrant linguistic community. As a complement to the a regional organization, membership on the national level at ATA affords the language professional the opportunity to participate in the industry beyond the local level and acquires a profile visible to national and international clients and contacts. The ATA permits translators and interpreters to interact with and be included in the ranks of the most brilliant and talented figures in our industry, those at the top of their game. In addition, two of the most obvious benefits of the ATA membership are the annual conference and the Chronicle, the quarterly publication. These alone are glowing examples of the extraordinary caliber of information that consistently promotes skill, knowledge, and growth essential to remaining competitive and successful in our field. Great. Now let's talk about how to join a chapter. Can you explain to our listeners how they can join a chapter or affiliate? Of course. Membership to any chapter affiliate is open to individuals, corporations, and institutions located within the designated geographical area who are active in the language industry or who have an interest in the field. All chapters and affiliates have a website with links to their membership application forms. For a complete list, one should refer to the ATA website www.atanet.org slash chapters and groups to identify which group is closest to where you live and work. Great. Chapters like ATA rely on the work of volunteers. But as Lucy told us earlier in the podcast, there are real benefits to volunteering. Is that the same? Is the same true for chapters? Yes, indeed, Matt. Similar to the volunteer work that happens with divisions, The very existence and vitality of chapters and groups depends largely on volunteer efforts of its leaders, its committees, and the workforce behind the programs. The beauty of the volunteer work is that the value and experience and the rewards it brings far outweigh the commitment of time and energy. Ask anyone who has ever been part of a team organizing an annual conference. The collegiality, the energy and enthusiasm the leadership skills, the creativity, and the calculated strategic planning all enhance our depth of experience as professionals beyond the translated document or our interpreting work in a courtroom. That's great. What's the best way to get involved? Well, some of the best directors, committee chairs or officers, all started out as curious attendees at one event or another where they recognized the uniqueness and vibrancy of the organization. Instinctively and without hesitation, they offer to put up signs, help out at registration, and before you know it, they're running for elected office. That reminds me a little bit of how I uh, started volunteering for the German Language Division, I think it was about 10 years ago now, um, simply by stepping forward and saying, hey, I'd be interested in helping out. And wouldn't you know, they had a job for me really quickly. But uh, um, I wouldn't have traded my experience over the last 10 years. That's for sure. Now, do you have any final thoughts for our audience, for our listeners today? I think it's important to recognize the uh, vital function of chapters and affiliates in the context of our daily lives as translators and interpreters. 
These groups or associations were started because of a real need and a lacking in our daily professional lives. Generally, it is a lonely profession and one which is still relatively young and evolving, its parameters still being defined. Translators are often isolated with their documents and software. Interpreters may be in a courtroom, in a hospital room, or a business meeting, only occasionally coming into contact with other interpreters. The reason our chapters and affiliates are thriving and producing outstanding professional development programming is that the leaders recognize that the membership's need for growth and connectedness is very present. By providing the framework of a supportive community, chapters and affiliates provide aspiration and the tools to sustain members in their efforts to achieve a highly functional and successful professional practice. Great. Thank you for so much for joining me today, Tony. I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, Matt. Episode 20 was produced by myself with support from Lucy and Tony, as well as Mary David, ATA's Assistant Executive Director for Membership and Communications. Mixing and editing was done by Human Factor Media. Rashawn Pacquerel, ATA's Assistant Executive Director for IT and Operations, provided technical and web support. The music you heard today was from bensound.com. Previous episodes of the ATA podcast can be found on ATA's website, atanet.org, under resources, or simply type in ATA podcast in the search engine. You can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Tuned In, Stitcher, and other podcasting apps. Please do me a big favor and leave a review or spread the word on social. I'm serious, people. Many ATA members and other language professionals don't yet know about our awesome show. They're missing out. You can change that. Speaking of social media, ATA is on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So if you haven't already, be sure to connect with us on your favorite channel. And if you have comments and suggestions, write to me anytime at podcast at atanet.org. Your suggestion just might be the next ATA podcast. Be sure to tune in next month to learn more about how the association's finances work. As you heard on today's show, a big ship like ATA runs on a lot of volunteer effort, but it also needs financial fuel to keep the crankshafts turning. Newly elected ATA Treasurer John Milan will open ATA's balance sheets and make some sense out of all the numbers. Thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Talk to you again next month.